Hello and welcome to the Creative Academy with me. I am Eileen Cook and I'm very excited to have with me today my good friend and author Robin Harding. Hello Robin. Hello Eileen. And we are here talking today a little bit about thrillers. Uh, Robin is the author of some of my favorite thrillers. Uh, so there is Her Pretty Face, which is her most recent book that is out. Also The Party. Uh, and Robin is a number of number of other books and sort of other genres which we'll talk about as well but we're going to focus a little bit on thrillers and that actually is my very first question because you started off writing chiclet so you wrote humor and all that you've done some screenwriting what made you turn to thrillers well i guess i was you know reinventing myself after leaving behind the whole uh chiclet i have to do air quotes for that um <laughs> genre and then writing like a comedy drama and when I wanted to write something new, I just thought about what I like to read and what really kind of captures my imagination and attention. And it was always really dark stuff. And I wasn't sure if I could do it. I, was, I had this idea, which was for the party. And I thought, I don't know if I will just go into a rabbit hole of um, depression if I, if I um, <laughs> try writing something so dark and with such heavy themes and, and so many terrible things happen to terrible people. Um, uh, but I wanted to try it. I wanted to challenge myself and, and uh, try something new. And I'm really glad I did. Because <laughs> it's been my most successful book, I would say. So, yeah. So I'm curious. I get this a lot when I'm sometimes talking to people about writing thrillers. They'll be like, but you seem like such a happy person. So I'm curious <laughs> if you get this thing where people are like, you're so dark. I had no idea. I get it all the time. Like, you seem so nice. And then they look at you like side eye, like, you know, you're... Um, the it's, truth comes it, out. Robin Harden yeah. has dark thoughts. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I mean, I guess it's our job, right? To, to explore these things and, and um, go deeper into uh, perhaps things that we might see in the media or hear about and these horrible things. And we're like, you know, what really goes on behind these kind of scenarios? And we can use fiction to, to get deeper into these. Um, stories and it doesn't mean that we're crazy murderers it just means that we have an imagination that we allow to go to a dark place I think I think obviously since they're so popular we're not the only people who are kind of interested in that element well, of know, stuff yeah like I, I did a panel with Liz Nugent who is um I'm a huge fan of hers and she is an Irish writer. She, I think she just won like Irish book of the year or something like two days ago I saw on Facebook and she had a very, uh, a very great insight into why women uh, in particular write thrillers is that we know the feeling of being vulnerable better than anybody, you know, like we walk home at night and we are looking over our shoulders and if we see somebody we are on guard and we are, you know, keys in the pocket or, we go into a parking garage at night and we have to think about, we have to look around and make sure it's not, we don't park anywhere too dark. And all the things that we as women, it's just part of our day to day, whereas men don't even have to think about that. So we, we're very in touch with this um, sense of fear that men, you know, my husband will say like, I never feel scared. Like, you know, he could walk at 4 a.m. He could walk to, through the forest and he would probably feel completely fine where I wouldn't even drive you know, to the area near the forest, the forest. You know, it's just a different. I'm worried about the Safeway parking lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. like I'm not going to... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's so. really interesting. And people, if they should, they should check out Liz Nugent because her books are amazing. Uh, yeah. Unraveling is, or not unraveling as well. Um, Your book. <laughs> that, that's my book. Hers is Oliver. Yeah, Unraveling yeah. Oliver. And then her newest book just came out on Tuesday, and uh, it is already a chapter's uh, book of the month. And it's called Lying in Wait, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Very yeah. funny and also very dark, yeah. What do you think of the term domestic thriller? Would you use that for yours, or would you call your books psychological thrillers? Because I know some people get caught up and they're trying to figure out, like, how to define what they're writing. Because some people think thrillers have to be sort of, you know, spies shooting up things, right. mystery, intrigue. But, you know, the kind of thrillers that you write, how would you define it? Um, well, definitely the marketing department at uh, Simon & Schuster defines them as domestic thrillers or domestic suspense. And I'm okay with that because I write a lot about families. I write about um, marriages and families, children, those kind of relationships, friendships. 
Um, it's funny because it never really occurred to me to be sort of offended by it or feel pigeonholed by it until recently. Um, again, I was on a panel with a writer who was saying that it's a, it's code for women for a, 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 yeah. a female written thriller and that she felt she was more rightly should be called a psychological thriller author instead of a domestic thriller author because um, what she was writing didn't have family dynamics in it. And my latest book that's coming out next year doesn't have family dynamics in it really either. Um, but, you know, my editor said, well, this is what's really working for you. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's definitely a label, but I think it also is what a lot of people want to read about. I know I like reading about those, those kind of, you know, so I, I would rather read about um, a suburban family going through something hellish than about a spy, probably. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let that go. <laughs> and I think that's really interesting because I do think it's that idea of, you know, that sometimes we use the term women's fiction, but you don't really hear like men's fiction. Like that's not really a marketing term, but I think one of the things that I certainly tell a lot of people is unless you're indie publishing where you have to kind of pick your own keywords and marketing terms, like most likely the publisher is going to come up with whatever term they think fits. Like yeah. you and I both date back from the, and we'll use our finger quotes, chick lit um, yeah. era. <laughs> Which that did, that one did offend me. I didn't like it either. And it was interesting because I didn't feel like the book that I wrote was chiclet and that it didn't involve, you know, shopping. It didn't involve shoes or shoes. Yeah. yeah, it or was, skinnies. yeah, it was funny. Like I, at least I was trying to make it funny. Like that was the goal, but I didn't think of it as sort of what I saw as chiclet. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to what sales and marketing thinks is going to push the envelope and work. Exactly. And, you know, that is their job. And um, if, if it gets my book into the right area of the store or, you know, the right page on the catalog when buyers are ordering books, then um, I trust that they know what they're doing. Or I certainly hope they do. Yeah. Fingers crossed. All right. So I uh, recently reread your book because uh, I had a chance to get a little bit of an early sneak peek. Uh, Her Pretty Face. Uh, and I wondered if you could tell people just a little bit about uh, what the book is and then kind of what inspired you or made you want to write it. Okay, so the story uh, um, in Her Pretty Face is basically a very intense friendship between two women who are moms. They meet uh, at their kids' elementary school and they're kind of all they have. Um, neither of them really fit in with the cool moms. And uh, so they develop a really, really strong bond. And so do their sons. And, and uh, it, you know, the, the two families become very, very close. But unfortunately, one of them um, is a teenage murderer living under an assumed name. You know, so, which happens. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, look carefully at your best friend. Um, so, yeah, I, um, you know, I got the idea for for this from... Uh, when Carla Homolka, who was a very notorious murderer, female murderer here in Canada, and she was released. And um, it wasn't until she was kind of discovered in living a very normal life, I think she has three children, and she was discovered at an elementary school, um, you know, volunteering on field trips and, and really being a part of that community. And as a mother who spent a lot of time you know, at my kid's school and that, knowing that vulnerable feeling of sending your kids off when they're little and leaving them all day alone at school and to think that there was someone like that um, could be blending seamlessly into the community was just really, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And there had been an incident at my kid's school, um, a sort of violent incident between two parents and it set us all on edge knowing that that, you know, he, it was a dad of two students and going there every day and seeing him and just knowing that he was capable of doing what he had done. And, um, you know, and nothing ever happened, but it's just this sense of vulnerability. And I just kept thinking about it and started thinking about what if it was a friend and, and what could you, what could you forgive? What can people change? It brought up all these themes for me. And I've gotten a certain amount of backlash because I know that in Canada we're very sensitive about that crime. It's probably one of the most horrible things that has ever happened in this country. But I didn't want to exploit the crime itself. It just, it, 
you know, it happened and we're all left to, to think, is, is it okay that she just lives a normal life now? That she is a mom. She's somebody, yeah. she's, she's, you know, she, and she's, what about these kids? Like the question of that too, like they did nothing wrong. Yeah. And suddenly they are, you know, paying the price or they will pay the price. I don't know if they know. Um, sorry, now my email's like bing bonging. It's super that. popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway so it brought it brought all those um those issues up for me and um i just really want to explore it through a fictional context well i think you know and i i've had the same sort of discussion with people where they say you know you're writing about such dark things and often they are inspired so i had a book that was inspired in part by the amanda knox trial and and people saying like oh well you know are you capitalizing on that or somehow um but inspiration, like whether or not you're, I mean, in our case, we're writing about crimes. And so there are certain things that come up in the news, but you might be writing about, you know, something, you know, in a very different genre that was inspired. Yeah. You might be writing a romance that was inspired by, you know, two figure skaters in the Olympics or, do yeah. you know what I mean, like we're all yeah. kind of pulling from different things, but it, then it becomes our story because it becomes, I mean, yeah. having read your book, the character is not Carla Homolka. Like that is not who it is. Yeah. No, because I don't know anything about her and nobody does, you know, yeah. like it's, um, yeah, like I, I was on a panel and, and a woman stood up, there were two of us, a woman that had written a true crime book and me, and she said, she basically went at us um, in a huge public uh, forum and said, don't, how can you live with yourself, right? You know, you're, there are victims out there. And I, and I was like, it took, you know, I, I kind of stammered my um, ex- explanation, but I really thought about it afterwards. And I thought, you know, I listened to a lot of um, true crime podcasts and um, you know I read dark books and I thought what is it that draws me to these kind of issues and I think it's just a it's it's just a sense of there's a lack of closure when we see something in the media uh, that has happened and we can't we can't you know wrap it up in a bow I mean I mean horrible it doesn't happens. And then also we're supposed to like never talk, speak of it again, right? Like it's like, it's horrible and it is horrible, and it, but it happened. And I think that sometimes we can use fiction to kind of steer through things that the fe- feelings that this brings up for people. And I, I think it's wanting to explore, like, you know, you talked about the themes, like, you know, is there anything um, that can't be forgiven sort of coming up yeah. in our pretty face? Yes, and- it's, it's a exactly a theme that that you know Thomas Mulcair who was the leader of the NDP at the time I remember there was a huge debate about her in parliament that is there no room for forgiveness and you know some people went crazy over that because they think that she should pay forever (laughs) you know and and some people think you know she was so it was just, it's a complex thing. And, and, uh, you know, it just was a theme that, that really resonated with me. And that's our job as authors is to kind of sort of figure that out. Um, which kind of actually rotates me into my next kind of question for you, which is you do a lot of sort of twists and turns. So not necessarily where, where people are like, ah, but there's definitely, you know, a lot of twists and sort of unexpected things that happen in your books. How much plotting do you do ahead of time? Like, do you know all of those when you sit down and write, or are you also sometimes surprised? Um, so I plot using screenplay structure because I worked as a screenwriter. Uh, should I say worked for free as a screenwriter <laughs> for quite a while? I did end up getting one film made, but I just did so much screenwriting that uh, went nowhere. Um, but I did learn a lot about um, dialogue and a lot about structure. And so I kind of use the three act structure and I, I use, um, they call them turning points, the key turning points in screenwriting. So those I know, those are the, the big plot points yeah. that have to hit at a certain point in the manuscript. And I use it sort of like as a coat hanger and I write towards the next okay. point. And do you use certain turning points? Like are you using like Save the Cat or the Hero's Journey or are you using kind of the more general like set story beats like do you have a do you have a cheat sheet <laughs> i do i have a little um let me show you <laughs> like i have it right here I have the home shopping network <laughs> it's kind of like this little shape it's like a little um uh a friend laid it out for me a screenwriter friend that she kind of cobbled together from a few books so it has kind of your inciting incident your midpoint scene you know your first turning point your midpoint scene your second turning point your climax 
So I find that really helpful whether I stick to it or not. Little twists, I think if there's ever an opportunity where you can go, you know what, let's you know, zig instead of zag and keep everybody off guard because as you know, you just need to look at Instagram or any kind of Amazon reviews and people are like, I figured it out, I already knew it, and oh, you know, like where it's so people, readers want to be challenged and they want to be surprised. And have you ever been surprised? Because I plot out ahead of time and I would say probably 90%, 95% of the book, I pretty much have a good idea of where it's going. But every so often, kind of as I'm writing, I get to know the characters a little better. And then I suddenly have that like, oh, I need to zig instead of zag. Like, yes. Well, it's funny. This is uh, the, my next book that will come out next summer in August, um, which is about a sugar daddy relationship that goes terribly wrong. Um <laughs> I they wrote, always go so terribly they right. Go, <laughs> they're awesome, but this one isn't. Um, <laughs> um, I I wrote that whole book with a uh, there's a someone is dead, and I wrote that whole book knowing who killed them until the end, and I was like, no, no, someone else did it, and I just like flipped it, and yeah, and I think it. Um, I hope it works. My editor thinks it works, so. I yeah. bet it works. That's my hunch. <laughs> now your um, last two books, and I don't know about the Sugar Daddy book, but they've had kind of rotating points of view. Um, what made you decide to sort of take that on? And how much do you kind of like popping in and out of the different heads as a way of telling the story? I, I love that. I love doing that. Um, I think that, you know, it's super fascinating to me how different people can see the same scenario <laughs> differently, right? So um, having that um, ability to go right into somebody else's brain and see what's going on from their perspective um, was, was great. I think I did more of that in um, the party where there's an incident and then I am viewing the same incident through various um, perspectives, whereas in her pretty face, I think it's more, they each have their kind of distinct storylines story that are kind of going on at um, different times. One's in the past and two are in the present. Um, and yeah, I guess there is still some, some you know, different points of view on a similar situation. But uh, I also feel it really moves a story along. Yeah. Right? Because you can go from, you know, from one character is in this place in the story and then we go visit someone else and go back to the next character and it could be five days later and all you know all this stuff has happened and it's just kind of a good I feel like for pacing um I, I'm enjoying it yeah so I'm curious with that and we're not going to open the whole own voices debate but just in terms of getting into heads that might be different than yours so writing from a male point of view or writing from a kid's point of view versus an adult like do you find that challenging at all or do you have any like suggestions for people I know some of our members have talked about like their concern that their characters all sort of sound like different variations of them. Like, right. right. Well, like, but I actually think that's kind of a good place to come from. It, it's, yeah. If you can put yourself in, especially like with a teenager or something, I mean, I guess I can't put myself into being like, you know, a 50 year old um, rugby playing man or, you know, like that's, a, that's more challenging, but I think, like, or at least relating to something in your own, if you're writing like a teen perspective, thinking about yourself as a teen or, or a friend as a teen and things that they were feeling and going through, um, you know, or, or if you're writing a male perspective, sometimes I find that harder. Um, although again, Liz Nugent, this is like an ad for Liz Nugent, but uh, <laughs> um, on this panel, she, she writes off, more often from a male perspective and she said, I actually find it easier because men are more upfront. They say what they think. Women, there's a lot more subtext with women. Um, you know, we're more, right. more, yeah. more cautious about what we say and men just kind of say it. So she, she actually finds it easier to um, write a male voice. So. And how much research do you do? I know just again, cause you know, in case people don't know, we sometimes talk not on the computer. And we've had talks about your book, uh, which will be out, you said, next summer? This summer, uh, summer? Yes, August. Uh, which is called The Arrangement. That's, as of today, uh, <laughs> that's a new title that the, the, we went back and forth on many, many titles, and I think that's where we have ended up. So, so tentatively called The Arrangement, we'll say that. Um, 
I know you did some research into sort of young women who, I don't know, I won't want to say you sugar daddies. I don't know what the terminology would be like. Like what made you sort of get into that research and like, was that fun or interesting or? It was so interesting and so eye-opening to me because I had this idea, um, you know, I had read that Vancouver where I live and you live, Eileen, um, that the universities in um, Vancouver and Victoria have the highest number of seeking arrangement profiles, which is a sugar daddy, sugar baby website. And I just was like, oh my God, like that's crazy. It is expensive here. So it is expensive <laughs> here. Yes, it is. But um, it is, but that's a huge line to cross. So, um, you know, I was Googling and, and reading um, articles and, and stuff on that. And uh, I had dinner with um, my Canadian publisher, Simon Schuster from Toronto. And the VP of marketing goes, she's a very cool woman. And she goes, so uh, what research have you done? And I was like, oh, quite a bit of Googling and reading articles. I'm just kind of winging it. And she's like, no. She goes, you need to set up um, a profile on one of these sites. Obviously not using my own. <laughs> they would run screaming. No one would answer me. Um, and you need to interview some of these women. She said a lot of them are very open about it. So I actually did that. I used like a stock photo and created a profile for my character. Um, you know, it's set in New York. So I basically, you know, art student in New York looking for this amount of money. And I was flooded, for my character, was flooded with um, emails from men who, like, I mean, it was, it was craziness. And I actually um, messaged with a couple of sugar babies and had, went out for juice with one. And she was extremely open about it and gave me so much insight into why they do would do this and and how you cross that line and what they get out of it and what type of person you perhaps need to be to be able to to do that and uh, it a lot of the stuff made its way into the book and made the book I mean I feel like it turned it it turned it completely you know I kind of like roughed it out and was written a few chapters and I was like oh no 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 start over now knowing what I know so um, I feel like it's a really a pretty true and uh, fascinating glimpse into how easily you could slip into that kind of world and life and uh, what that could ultimately mean. I wonder if anyone's looking for a sugar baby, you know, coming up on 50. I'm guessing not. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I'm just you never know, that. actually, the stuff that uh, <laughs> they're I, in. I'm, I'm an artist, writer, speaking an arrangement. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you have a real knack for dialogue and I'm curious if you think that comes from sort of your screenwriting background or if that was just something that always came easier for you uh, and if you had any suggestions for people on writing dialogue because yours just reads very authentic to the people oh thank you thank you you know what and I I'm sorry to say but I do think that is my strength and always has been um it's everything else that I struggle with I, like sometimes when I'm like feeling stuck I just go right to the dialogue and just write it like a script and that is actually why I started screenwriting in the first place is that people were always telling my telling me my dialogue was um was so strong in books but one thing that I do do that I think um people should always do is read it out loud okay. read it out loud read it like you're that character because it sounds completely different sometimes. Like we, we tend to write very formally when we're writing and sometimes people don't make that distinction when it's dialogue and people don't talk that way. So try to make it as I, I think, try to make it sound as, um, you know, legitimate as possible. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one of the things that you're talking about that I think is good advice for people is to kind of figure out like what your personal superpower is, like right. whether it's dialogue or writing funny or writing creepy or suspense or plotting or, but I think a lot of us, we have like one area, like, I don't know anyone because I'd have to kill them if I did, who was like good at all of it, but everybody right. kind of has, you know, one or two things, it's their thing. And, you know, when you're stuck, like then go back to that thing. And I think it yeah. then takes everything else free a little bit. So, I think so too. Some, some days you, you go, you know what, all I'm up for is what's easy to make me. 
Yeah. So I will write, you know, like a few scenes that are just a lot of dialogue and then I have to go in and set the scene and where they are and describe the, like for me, that's more laborious and I'm not as good at it. Um, so I do that when I'm feeling up for it. But when you have the structure, it's just so much easier to, to fix something on the page is easier than to try and like create it completely from a blank page. <laughs> so yeah. Kind of going like, you know, if dialogue's your thing, then write a whole bunch of dialogue. And then if you have to make some of it internal or, you know, change it up right. or add setting, then then go yes. back to do that. True, true. And the other thing I was going to say when you said humor, um, you know, you and I used to both write funny books. And I thought, oh, but I love that. I loved, I loved it. And I, but I think there's always room for some humor in even the darkest story. And when I'm reading something really dark, and I still have like a chuckle or a snicker or whatever. Um, I appreciate it so much. And I think it's also, you know, I mean, it, it, it kind of um, makes that roller coaster ride of, of, a, of a thriller even more because you're one minute you're laughing and then you're like, oh, my God, you know. Um, so I, I actually think it's, it's good if, you, if you've got that, I think. There's always yeah. room for I think a little, darker um, books need a little bit like yeah. they absolutely do have to have it in a way that you know other books may not like if even yeah. if you're writing like a very serious you know dark thing on child abuse in Nova Scotia or whatever like yeah. occasionally having something that someone can yeah. laugh at is it's yeah. often what keeps people reading like yeah it kind of yeah. gives you something to hang on to I've read a few books lately where I'm like there was not one Moment. nothing light, lighthearted at all and it was still it was still a good book but I I always feel like maybe you know maybe that author just that's not their um style or their strength but when I do read something that at least you know I always talk, think about um one of my favorite books and movies is Notes on Scandal yes and loved it so much and it was so dark but at times so witty you know, it was just such an interesting perspective. And, and yeah, I love, I loved it. Loved it. I think there's a reason like people often like get the giggles and things at places like funerals. It's because yeah. I think when you're in those dark places, you sometimes need yeah. that balance. Yes, absolutely. So before we go, do you have any other advice for people who are kind of intrigued by thrillers, things that they should think about or do or any suggestible, helpful tips or advice? Um, Jeez, you know, if you're if you're worried, I guess that's what I would say from my perspective. If you're worried that it, it will that it will be too dark of an experience or too depressing, um, don't be. I think that once you get into it and start, you know, I really enjoy the twists and the turns, and I don't dwell on the murdery stuff. You know, it's not it's not like haunting me when I leave my computer behind. It's fiction. Yeah, you're just a dark soul, though, Ron. Well, that's true. <laughs> dark and creepy person. You know, you know. But um, yeah, I think that yeah, you can do it. You can do it and still be very normal and happy. Yeah, and I think it's the thing of what pulls you into the story. And um, you know, for each of your books, there was kind of something that was like, oh, that's intriguing to me. And then you sort of follow it down the rabbit hole and play that what yeah. if game. Like, I, yeah. like when you said that thing, I was like, and now I'm totally fascinated. Um, I may have to write some kind of YA about sugar babies or something like, because right. I had no idea that that was so big in Vancouver, but it's, wow. you know, yeah. it's that thing where you follow that and it's like, okay, well, that's interesting to me. Or, you know, can, you know, Carla Homolka is out and volunteering at her kid's bake sale. Yeah. Like, where does that take you when you start thinking about it? So yeah. being willing to follow your own interests. Yeah. Is that's, that's exactly true. And people say, where do you get your ideas? And it's like, something I hear either through a friend or the media or and I'm like what what is it that where it just niggles in the back of your mind and you keep yeah. thinking about it like I already have an idea for another book and it's just a it's just something that I'm like wow that's something that has always fascinated me and I can't really let it go so I should write a book about it there you go well we will let you write a book about it okay. so I want to thank you for your time today Robin and people should definitely be checking out your books uh, so we have the party, her pretty face, and coming up this summer for your summer beach reading will be the arrangements. Uh, so you can get all your sugar daddy tips and know how to start your second business. <laughs> all right. A how to. <laughs> yeah, a little how to. How not to, maybe. Yeah, that might be it too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robin, and thanks to everybody else. And we hope to see you all around the academy. Take care. Thanks, Eileen. Are you a member yet? 
Join us today and unlock a wealth of resources, masterclasses, feedback opportunities, and community events designed to help you reach the next step in your writing journey. No matter what stage you're at, we've got a helping hand to guide you along the way. Check out our free resource room if you'd like to get a taste of how we can help you reach your writing and publishing goals. Thanks for bringing us along on your writing and publishing journey. Donna, Crystal, and I hope we'll see you around the Creative Academy soon.